Good afternoon guys, my name is Brandon and with the holidays coming up, I'm going to show you some holiday gift ideas and we're going to have a MIG welding project today. Let's get going. For this week's project guys, we're going to be building a budget minded reclaimed wood coat rack. And here's a sneak peek of what we're going to be building. So let's get going. I'll show you the materials and everything we're going to need to do this. A lot of this stuff you can source out, pick out for very cheap or next to nothing. So like I said, this is going to be a MIG welding project. First thing we're going to do is we're going to need some railroad spikes. Now you can get these pretty much from your local rail yard if you stop by. They usually have buckets of these that they're just willing to give away. Uh, this is three and a half inch by eighth inch flat bar. That's scrap that's left over. And we got three little pieces of pallet wood. Pallet wood is usually pretty easy to find. In our area, a lot of times uh, people will put pallets out by the edge of the road by their businesses and people take them, especially close to winter. They end up burning them, use them as a heat source. Now my thoughts on this is I want to have like three hooks. So I'm going to make it 32 inches wide. And that should be able to space the hooks out enough so that the coats aren't on top of each other. A lot of you guys ask me what I mark my metal with, and this is just a mark all silver streak. And any of the products that you see me using, I have links down in the description. You guys can check them out. I'm cutting this with my evolution saw, but you guys don't have to cut it with that. You guys can use an abrasive wheel, you can use a metal cutoff disc, and with metal cutoff disc, I'll show you the one that I love the best. So this is the disc that I use whenever I cut metal. I just really love this. I think this comes out of Germany, I'm not sure. But the one thing that I like about this is that you can see the rim around this. It's continuous, it doesn't have little segments. I used to do my cuts with this one, but I find that it's kind of jumpy because it has these open cooling fins so it tends to cause the blade to bounce around a little bit so yeah some people say that these blades cut a little bit slower I really don't uh, notice it I personally prefer this blade over that one but that's a personal preference but I just wanted to let you know if you cut with a metal blade this seems to work really good and here I'm using my Evolution Tools chop saw and if you want to save up to 5% you can click the links down below and you can find out more about these tools and many others. Look at that guys, perfectly straight, no heat. Now there are a lot of ways you could build this and you could pretty much use an angle grinder with a cutoff wheel and an angle grinder with a grinding disc to pretty much do almost all of this except for the sanding of the wood but you don't need to use a lot of the tools that you see me using in this project but these are just some of the benefits of you know after a while you build up your tool collection and it makes your work project a lot easier kind of like this fabrication table this makes work a little bit easier we won't really need it today but these are just some of the things that uh, you can work towards. These spikes are pretty rough, but what they're going to do is they're going to weld onto this like that. I'm going to make these, and I'm just kind of roughing it out about two inches away from the head. From like this surface, I'm cutting it off at two inches. Now, it doesn't have to be perfect. It can be kind of whatever, whatever you want to make it, you know. So now that we've got these all marked out, now we'll bring them over to the portable bandsaw stand. I'm telling you guys, I love this. This was a super fun, easy build. If you haven't seen it, check out this video. If you guys have a bandsaw, you really need to make one of these because it is a huge, huge, huge time saver. Switch right down here, turns it on, and it comes off and on in seconds. It's awesome. In that video, guys, I explain in detail how you can build this. This is a toolless design. You don't need any tools to remove this saw off that stand, and I give you step-by-step -step instructions on how to build it. I am just so happy how this came out, and it is a huge time saver versus taking out my big uh, chop saw and using that. Plus, it's portable. Some of these have like a real thick layer of um, like rust and scale on them. And that's not going to be good if you want to paint them. So you can see that one's really bad. This one, not so much. This one just has like a light surface coat on it, but nothing that would be flaky. So this one, you could just hit it with a wire brush and you'd be all set. But you couldn't do that with this one. So what I ended up doing was, is I took a chipping hammer 
and I just kind of like chipped the surface of it to get all the flaky loose rust off and then I think what we'll do is then we can go along it and hit it with a wire brush then but yeah a wire brush just won't remove flaky shaley rust so I'll show you what I mean you may encounter this maybe you won't like I said this one all you could do is just hit it with a wire brush you'd be all set this one you can't do that it's almost like this one had been laying on the ground for a while or something this is just a regular welding chipping hammer that I'm using but watch you'll see the it's like almost like slag just peels off and it actually feels like loose when you hit it you know, if you want your paint to stick to this you're gonna have to knock this layer off you could also grind it off also but grinding rust makes a huge dust mess and I don't want that in the workshop if you had a needle scaler, that would work also, like a pneumatic needle scaler, that'd work great for this. Now here I'm just going over everything really lightly with a 120 grit flap disc. I just want to make everything so it's smooth and it feels good in your hand. If you want to save up to 10% off Empire Abrasives, use promo code LUND and it'll save you a little bit of money. Okay, so I've got them all uh, at least cleaned up with a flap wheel now. Now I think one of the real important things to do when you do whenever you're doing something like this is to just put your fingers on it and like feel it all around I, i'm like a real uh like tactile person like if you feel something and it and it feels like it's real smooth and it's got a nice finish to it when you touch it then it kind of like gives you the impression that it's um built well you know if you put this together and welded it all up and then it's a finished product and then somebody comes up and they can feel like little burrs and stuff here and there that just kind of says to me it's just not as good so um, for me that's a huge thing so make sure things like really not only just look good but they feel good when you, when you touch them that they're nice and smooth and they have kind of like a slick feel to them it just kind of gives that finished appearance now there's one other thing I noticed while I was doing these all three of these aren't identical you can see how this one and this one have like lines in them so what I'm gonna do is I'm going to put this in the middle and then I'll put these to the outsides like that and that'll kind of balance it you know not that you notice but I mean somebody might I probably would if it was like that if it was like a line a line then not probably be noticeable but if you put it in the middle make it symmetrical yeah, then it kind of looks like you tried. Looks like you did it that way. And there's no right and wrong. That's just how I prefer to do it. So now we got these all cleaned up. Now what we got to do is we're going to put bevels on all four edges of this at like a 45. And that'll give us a nice uh, area to pound the weld right into that. So we can get a nice bond on that. Not that coats are all that heavy, but, you know, just kind of make a nice job. Now here's a couple other tool builds guys that uh, I've been working on and a lot of you guys have probably seen this. This is my mag drill base which was once a drill press stand and I bought this whole thing off Facebook marketplace for cheap and then I just had to modify that. But uh, The next tool that we need to use is our bench grinder and this is something that is totally awesome. So this is an old truck wheel. This is a plate that we cut out with a plasma cutter and that is all filled with sand for vibration dampening. And this whole setup like barely moves. It's like 150 pounds, this whole thing. So this grinder like doesn't go anywhere. It does not move. It's like super rigid. It's awesome to, to grind with. So, but yeah, that's what we're gonna use to bevel all our edges. But you could use a hand grinder and just bevel the edges of those as well. So you don't necessarily need this. A few of you guys have commented that you've actually built this and how great that it is having sand in there. And I have to agree, it really deadens the sound. It keeps the noise from reverberating throughout the shop. I'm real happy with it. You guys should check it out. It's a real good build. Now overall guys, this is 32 inches wide. So I'm gonna start by laying it out on center. So half of that is 16. And that will be where my center uh, railroad spike goes. So then I'll just put a center line for that and that will help locate that one for when we go to weld it. So this next part is more visual than anything guys. So I just kind of got everything laid out how it's going to be and how it's going to look. And that's how it's going to be like this. So you have the option of you know, putting the hooks right close to the end. I think that that's what I'm going to do. And yeah, I think that that'll 
that'll look good. So I'll probably come in, oh, inch and a half from the end. So one in the center, at, so this is 32 wide, so that's at 16. Now we'll come in an inch and a half on each side, and that's where we'll put the other, the other hook. I just marked center across the middle, you know, this way, and now we're all set. Pretty much ready to weld. Generally, you'd want to grind away the mill scale. Uh, I'm literally just going to put it on here, and we will just burn through the mill scale. This will be a strong enough weld that we don't have to worry about uh, these hooks coming off. It'll, it'll eat right into that mill scale. And for this guy, I'm going to be welding it up with my Fronius Transteel 2200. I'm using 30 thousandths solid wire. This is a fully synergic machine, meaning that all you do is put in a few different parameters and it sets up the amperage and voltage for you. Now we just turn on the bottle. Now always stand off to the side and open it real slowly because you don't want the insides of this can pop. You know, if this was to explode, the gauge to come off or whatever could, uh, you know, hit you with a lot of force. We're at about 2,000 PSI right now of pressure on that. Now, this machine, you just turn on your purge valve. Now, watch what happens. When I hit this, it'll actually turn on the solenoid and allow me to adjust that pressure. Ready? You see that? So you can see we're at 20. Now, this will turn off after 30 seconds if I forget to press it. But right now I can adjust my CFH in my gas up and down. Now just hit it again and then it turns off. See that? So for material thickness, let's, uh, that's amperage material thickness. Let's call it uh, 125 thousandths. See, and you can see I've got it selected for a steel wire, 30 thousandths uh, solid wire and 2T is the trigger mode. 2T means that you pull the trigger and it feeds the wire, then you let off it and it stops. 4T is you pull it, it'll feed the wire. It's like cruise control on a car. It'll keep feeding it until you pull the trigger again and then it will stop. And you can see I'm set on uh, C25 argon gas. So let's give that a whirl, give it a try. But let's say you didn't have a fully synergic machine and you didn't know really what to start with or you didn't know what to set your settings for. Well, here's another way of doing it. Now, this is the Miller Welds online app. And all you got to do is you can pick whatever process you want. You can see we got stick, TIG, MIG, which is solid wire, or MIG flux core welding. So we're using solid wire, so we'll click on that. And then that brings up a screen. It's asking us, what are we welding for material? So we're welding just regular steel, so we'll select that. Then we're gonna select what's our material thickness. And you can see here it's saying for 30 thousands wire, we want our wire speed between 250 to 340 inch per minute. If we were 35 thousands wire, we'd run it between 240 and 260 inch per minute. So yeah, this is the one we're gonna be using. So again, guys, I'm making sure that I have the oddball one, or the one that's a little different, set out for the middle. And we're just going to put a little tack on it. And the reason that we do that is put little tacks is if you make a mistake, it's a lot easier to break a tack off than it is to fix it when it's fully welded. And this is an inverter-based welder. It does TIG, stick, and MIG. It runs on 110 or 220. It's an awesome welder. Now you kind of get the idea. Now we'll just kind of look at it, see how things, you know, if they look fairly even, sight down it to make sure that they all, they're not canted or tipped up and down, that they look um, fairly consistent to what you expected and how you wanted them to turn out. These look really good and they look nice and even along the front. So we can now actually fully weld these out. They're ready to, to fully weld. But if you made an error, okay, so let's say you made a mistake and you needed to move something. This is easy now. Even though we welded um, like across this, all you have to do is grab this and bend it towards me. Bend it towards the side of the weld. And what that'll do is that'll bust that weld right along the toe of the weld or right in the middle of it usually. 
and then you just grind it flush, clean it up, and then you can reset. But yeah, if you weld both sides, it doesn't work that way. You, you can't... Uh, you can't snap it off like that. Now with the holidays coming up, this is something that you can build for relatively cheap that someone would really appreciate to have. And I've got a couple other videos that I did uh, a while back, and I'll put some link up above. You can check those out. But, you know, this doesn't have to be for the holidays. This can kind of help you fine-tune and hone your welding skills while still being able to make something. You could sell these at a local uh, shop. You could sell these during a craft fair. These type of projects are great ways to get your name out there, to build stuff that you're proud of and to make a little bit of side money which is also nice so now with that all built now we got to start working on this wooden piece and I think what I'm going to do is pick the side that I like the best um, I'm going to leave it kind of rough like this on the ends and we'll just smooth it all up afterwards with a palm sander but um, on the back side we're going to put a cleat that goes across it in three separate places and that'll bind all three of these boards together. Working with pallet wood can have its challenges, though it does look really nice and you can get it for free. The drawback is that you have to work it that much more. A lot of it has uh, splinters on it, so it's really rough and you don't want to build something that's going to end up hurting someone, but it does have a really rich look to it. But another concern is, is mold or mildew. And again, you don't want to build something that has mold or mildew. If the pallet was stored in a wet area or a damp area, you're going to probably want to avoid it. And if you have that wood and you can't avoid it, then at least make sure you give it a good uh, washing with some bleach that will help kill all that mold. So those are just some considerations when working with pallet wood. So here I just put a little Sharpie mark right there. And now I'm just going to take my calipers and just make a line so now you can see I've got a nice crisp line right there and I'll just do that all the way around. And by coloring in your marking area with a sharpie it just helps to highlight the area when you scribe it. It makes you see it better. Now you can either use an automatic center punch which is what I have or just a regular punch. It's whichever you prefer. Automatic center point punches are nice though. You watch. So you just hold that right on the mark and boom. Gives you a nice precise mark to start your drill bit. What I do is turn on the magnet. Now this thing is locked right onto this base right here. And now we just drill it like a regular drill or like a drill press. So for those of you that haven't seen this build video, this started out to be a regular drill press, but once I got it home, I found it on Marketplace. Once I got it home, I found that the centrifugal switch inside the motor, that had been all bent up. Somebody messed with that. The bearings were gone. It was in pretty rough shape. So I cut off the top part of the drill, welded on a flat plate, and used this for my magnetic drill. And I've wanted to build this for a long time, and I was lucky to find a good deal. You can find them. You just got to look. So now we're going to install this on our little back decorative piece and we just need to center everything up left to right top to bottom I'm just using the same drill bit that I was using in the uh, mag drill press and I just put it in to a hand drill and then I'll just drop a bolt down through it as we go to help hold everything together Now I'll remove this and we'll start working on the uh, wood underneath, just cleaning it up a little bit. But before I get too far, I'm going to take this off and I'm going to put up, make a little up indicator so I don't lose um, reference of how this has to go. So that way I know my holes will line up. So I mentioned earlier that I was going to use a palm sander to sand this, but I actually changed my mind. I'm using a 120 grit flap disc, the same flap disc I cleaned up the metal, and it does a really good job. Just be sure you're not doing this with like a hard rock or a hard disc. It'll clog up. It could explode. It's got to be a flap disc if you're going to do it this way. Again, guys, just doing that hand test again, running your fingers over everything, running your hand across it, make sure it feels really good and smooth, and it doesn't have any... Uh, splinters because you certainly don't want to be uh, producing a product that's going to hurt somebody. And there it is guys. I'm real happy how that uh, came out. And it, like I said, it feels good. Everything's all smooth. Feels nice. That's the back side obviously. Oh yeah. Nice 
quality product that you can be proud of. The only thing I have left is to clean up these welds right here. So I'm going to just clamp it down to the table and that'll allow us to apply some good pressure to clean everything up nice. And I'm just using a knotted wheel to clean this up. These clamps I built using some Harbor Freight clamps that I cut up and then I ended up welding a shoulder bolt on the end of it and the shoulder bolts fit down inside the prefabricated holes of this table and if you want to see how I built these clamps in this fabrication table be sure to check out that video it's pretty awesome and it didn't cost a lot of money so now we'll wipe it down with some paint thinner get any grease and grime and stuff off it so it'll, the paint will adhere good and you want to wipe it down until the cloth is no longer dirty, so when you wipe this down and this isn't dirty anymore, you know it's clean. Now another thing that you want to be mindful, guys, when you're working with solvents is don't just throw them in the trash, the rags. I have a dedicated bin in my workshop. It's all metal. And I take all my rags, anything that, you know, even gloves, even rubber gloves that have had solvents or chemicals on them, that includes stain any uh, type of epoxies that I'm working with and, and I've marked it and that's the only thing that goes in this. And the reason for that is, is sometimes these products can uh, spontaneous combust and you don't want that in your workshop. So don't take solvent soaked rags or brushes or stain soaked rags or any other thing and just throw it in your regular garbage. Make sure you separate all your flammable materials and put it in an airtight metal container. It could just save your workshop from burning down. And because I don't like messes, I try to uh, put down cloths, drop cloths whenever I can so I don't get overspray everywhere. And so I've got it suspended now. And now I'm just going to spray on some hammered black finished paint. You can see how that's uh, got a nice little crinkle finish. So yeah, that's what we're going to spray it with. And while that's drying, then I can start cleaning all this dust and nonsense out of the workshop. You can see. Yeah, that's why I don't like working with wood in the workshop. Look, makes a mess. So after I sprayed on two light coats of this black paint, then I went over it and sprayed two light coats of clear just to help protect everything. So while that is drying, now I'm just going to put on a clear satin water-based uh, sealer on the wood. So it's going to be it's going to be natural. We'll do a couple coats of this, and I think that'll look good. Truth be told. This is actually for my wife's office, and this is how she wants it, and this is the color she wants it, so that's what I'm doing. The clear that I'm using here, I really like. It's just a water-based clear satin polyurethane, and it's easy cleanup, and that's what I like, and it has low fumes. So if you have a workshop that you don't want to you know, open up your windows because it's cold outside, this stuff is great because it literally has no odor, and it's super easy to clean up using just warm soap and water. This side, I'm not going to quite so just haphazardly slap it on. I'm going to do a nice job, but you want to seal all the all the edges and all the surfaces just so it seals in uh, any moisture and stuff. Now, if you're wondering about the wood, uh, what species of wood it is, these two outside ones are oak, and the inside one looks to be like a pine. But you don't really see the inside one other than a little bit. Uh, on the side, so again, just trying to keep things a little bit symmetrical, you know. Yeah, a couple more coats will be good to go. So, originally, I was going to go with this type of screw, it's kind of like a washer head setup, but then I got thinking, I don't know if I like the looks of that against the metal. See how that's kind of got that wrinkle finish, and then I mean, I guess. So because I didn't really think I liked that look of it standing out like that. So what I ended up going with is these from my hardware store. And they were 25 cents a piece. And it came with the nut. Uh, but what I really like is, is that it's done. It's like a, a button head. It's flush. It's smooth. It'll look, it'll look nice. As opposed to this. I could paint these. But then when I go to tighten them down, they're going to spin. The paint is going to get uh, messed up. So, yeah, these are just a better all-around option. All right, guys, this is the best part to any project. This is where we start putting it all together, and all our hard work uh, starts looking really good, or hopefully it does. So, 
I've got uh, two coats of poly on this. I went with two. It seems to be nice and sealed. Uh, it's, it's an inside piece, so we don't have to worry about moisture getting to it. And uh, i got my arrow facing up. And I've got my metal piece facing the right way. And I'll just start putting our screws down through. I did have to uh, drill these holes out a little bit bigger in the metal guys just because I was right. Uh, it didn't fit down through the shoulders. The carriage bolts didn't fit down through the metal, so I had to do it. This looks really nice. And if you guys follow my YouTube and uh, Facebook stories and follow me on Instagram, you'll know that my uh, grandson and I signed this and this is going to be a gift for my wife. Check this out guys, I am so glad I went with those black carriage bolts because they almost look like rivets. to it guys if this is something that you like please don't forget to rate comment and subscribe new videos every friday if you're wondering what i'm working on before it makes it up to youtube you guys can catch me on facebook and on instagram i'll have links down below if you're wondering about any of the tools or equipment you see me using you can click the links down in the description and that'll take you to the tools that you see me using until next friday guys i will see you then take care stay safe see ya